Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Rear Admiral Retired Sam Cox, the Director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, and welcome to this fourth iteration of the CNO's Naval History Essay Contest. As one of my personal heroes said, uh, General James Mattis, that we've been fighting on this planet for over 10,000 years. It would be idiotic and unethical for us not to take advantage of the accumulated experience of those who came before. Any commander who claims that they're too busy to read will fill the body bags with his troops as he learns the hard way. Uh, this theme was actually carried on by our previous Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson, in his design for maintaining maritime superiority, uh, in which he stated it was imperative that we know our history so that we don't relearn the lessons of history the hard way. And our current CNO, Admiral Gilday, has continued this very enthusiastically, for which we are very grateful. The history essay contest consists of two primary elements, the professional historian category and the rising historian category. And the purpose for dividing it into two was to give those junior members of all ranks uh, within the United States Navy an opportunity to compete for a prize uh, and not have it always go to some PhD uh, somewhere. But we also wanted to have the professionals engaged as well uh, so that we get the full participation across the spectrum of the United States Navy. The essay contests have been extremely successful. Uh, this year there were 113 entries, 12 in the professional category uh, and 101 in the uh, rising historian category. Uh, we've been able to do this through an extraordinary partnership with the United States Naval Institute led by Vice Admiral Retired Pete Daly. Uh, it has been a great symbiotic relationship uh, in order to make this happen as there's no one on the planet who does better at HESE contests than the Naval Institute. So we continue the partnership. We also thank uh, other organizations such as the Naval War College, Naval Postgraduate School, Opera, OPNAV for providing judges uh, to assist in the contest. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Michael Gilday, uh, who will announce the winners of the contest. Thank you all. Shipmates, Admiral Mike Gilday here to congratulate the winners of our 2020 CNO Naval History Essay Contest. You know the quote, if you want a new idea, read an old book. It happens to be more than just a saying, it's the truth. And to outthink our competitors, we must study and apply the lessons we've learned from the past to improve ourselves today. The winners of this essay contest have done exactly that. They've examined our Navy's history and helped to inform our thinking today to deepen the discussion on how we can and will maintain maritime superiority for years to come. So, congratulations to our four award winners. Commander Joel Holwood, PhD, who won the professional history category and he's on his way to command a submarine. First Lieutenant James Winnefeld, United States Marine Corps, who won first prize in the rising historian category. Lieutenant George Hageman, Judge Advocate General Corps, won second prize, and Lieutenant Commander Andrew Rucker took third prize in that category. Their essays will be published in proceedings and posted on NHHC's website. Thank you to all 113 of the entrants for your impressive efforts in researching and writing the essays. The overall quality and creativity displayed in this year's entries was awesome. In closing, I urge you to continue to research, to write, and to read naval history. After all, learning is the ultimate warfare enabler. Congratulations, shipmates. Hello, I'm Commander Joel Holwitt. I'm here at Historic Ship Nautilus in Groton, Connecticut. 
next to Summering Base New London, where I am a student in the Summering Command Course. I am honored to be a winner of the 2020 CNO Naval History Essay Contest. I am grateful to the CNO, the Naval Institute, the Naval History and Heritage Command, and General Dynamics for running this contest that allows us to use our history to guide our future. Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt, Jr. served as our 19th Chief of Naval Operations 50 years ago from 1970 to 1974. The challenges he faced are remarkably similar to those we confront today. Our country was winding down a long ground war in Asia. Congress was cutting the Navy's budget. And Zumwalt somehow had to modernize the fleet in the face of a rapidly growing and globally deployed Soviet Navy that threatened the U.S. Navy's ability to control the seas. Zumwalt identified three priorities. Maintaining the Navy's strategic deterrent, refocusing the Navy on sea control, and improving personnel retention. Examining how Zumwalt addressed these priorities should inform how we are confronting similar challenges today. Admiral Zumwalt's first priority was strategic deterrence. He knew that the 41 for Freedom nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, SSBNs, such as the USS George Washington, behind me, would start decommissioning in the early 1980s. Zumwalt accelerated production of the next generation SSBN, known as Trident. Behind me is the massive hull frame of the Ohio-class submarine that carries the Trident missile. Thanks to Admiral Zumwalt's high prioritization, the 18 Ohio-class submarines entered service between 1982 and 1997. The Ohio replacement submarine, Columbia SSBN 826, is not slated to go on patrol until October of 2030. Following Zumwalt's example, we need to ensure that we direct the funds and manpower to make sure that she goes to sea on time. When Zumwalt became CNO in 1970, the Navy faced a threat it had not faced since the Battle of Leyte Gulf, an enemy battle fleet capable of contesting command of the sea, in the air, on the surface, and beneath the waves. Zumwalt prioritized sea control at the expense of missions such as power projection and peacetime presence. Zumwalt cut ships while continuing development of the critical sea control platforms that we associate with the 1980s Navy, the Spruance class destroyer, the Los Angeles class fast attack nuclear submarine, the S3A Viking anti-submarine warfare aircraft, the F-14 Tomcat interceptor. Zumwalt also accelerated development of the Harpoon anti-ship missile, which you can see behind me. Today, we likewise need to emphasize sea control weapons and platforms, even if this means cutting capabilities that do not contribute to sea control. But there was an even greater challenge. When Zumwalt became CNO, the Navy's re-enlistment rate was an unsustainable 9.5%. Zumwalt committed himself to improving the quality of Navy life, including addressing racism and opening Navy billets to women. Zumwalt targeted old-fashioned restrictions on junior sailors. For instance, when Zumwalt became CNO, only officers and chiefs could wear civilian clothes on ships, while sailors' overnight liberty, even in home port, required special request jits. Many of us have benefited from Zumwalt's personnel innovations, such as the Sponsor Program, the Meritorious Advancement Program, the Ombudsman Program, the Sailor of the Year program, and the Fleet Force and Command Master slash Senior Chief Petty Officer programs. Like Admiral Zumwalt, we need to address racism, working spouses. We need to improve the retention of female sailors who must juggle careers and family. After half a century, there's still plenty to learn from Admiral Zumwalt. I hope you'll read my essay to learn more. If we do study our history and learn from Admiral Zumwalt, then we can follow his parting words as CNO to set us steaming on a heading toward regaining the undisputed supremacy at sea, which our national survival demands. I am Lieutenant Commander Andy Rucker, assigned to the Naval Computers and Telecommunications Area Master Station in Atlantic. I am both humbled and honored that my submission, entitled The Little Carriers That Could, Lessons for Great Power Competition from the Independence Class Light Carriers, was selected as a third place winner. I would like to thank the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gilday, for hosting this important contest. Busy operational schedules too often uh, prevent opportunities to learn from the Navy's rich history. As the CNO noted, studying history shortens our learning cycles and keeps us ahead of our competitors. Inspired by my time serving on the USS Bataan, LHD-5, my paper discusses the genesis and service history of the Independence Class aircraft carriers. Rushed into service early in World War II, these ships were far smaller and less capable than the Essex-class fleet carriers the Navy's was building. 
Despite their humble dimensions, the light carriers provided a vital boost to the Navy's air power as the United States went on the offensive against Imperial Japan. The light carriers, as they were called, earned collectively 81 battle stars, three presidential unit citations, and one Navy unit citation. This is a classic underdog story, and one that has interesting parallels to the questions of fleet architecture the Navy is grappling with in an era of renewed naval competition with the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. My takeaways. First, we should not let perfect be the enemy of good enough. And second, the Navy-Marine Corps partnership, as demonstrated in World War II and Korea, is a potent force multiplier. In the 1920s and 1930s, thanks to a rigorous series of war games and fleet exercises, the Navy determined that a carrier's combat effectiveness was related to the size of its air wing and that large air wings required large carriers to operate them. This basic reality is true today. The combat potential of a Nimitz-class carrier, for example, is far greater than that of the Russian Kuznetsov-class carrier, which displaces less than half that of a Nimitz-class. By 1940, the Navy was rapidly expanding in anticipation of a worsening international situation. The expansion included the large Essex-class fleet carriers, but their construction was limited by shipyard capacity. The only way to rapidly increase the carrier fleet was to convert Cleveland-class light carriers, or excuse me, light cruisers already under construction. These ships have been, been designed to be fast enough to keep up with the fleet carriers. The Navy initially resisted the idea but President Franklin Roosevelt's personal interest and the shock of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor convinced the Navy to proceed. In all, nine Independence-class carriers were built, and only one was lost in combat, USS Princeton. As one post-war report put it, the Independence-class inflicted more damage on the enemy than they would have inflicted, probably, had they been built as cruisers. After the war, the Navy sought to divest the light carriers, but there was still some life left in the little flat tops. The first USS Bataan gave sterling service off the coast of Korea during the Korean War. She served as a mobile air base for Marine F4U Corsairs, providing close air support to their beleaguered comrades on the ground. Between 1951 and 1953, Bataan added another six battle stars to the seven she earned during World War II. An enviable achievement and one that highlights the flexibility, agility, and lethality of the Navy Marine Corps team. The Independence class, which made up a quarter of the Navy's striking power during the Pacific Campaign in World War II, were the little carriers that could. Despite the Navy's preference for large carriers, the light carriers made an indelible mark. They serve as a shining example of how, in warfare, a good enough solution today is often superior to a perfect solution tomorrow. As both batons have illustrated, sailors and marines working together to adapt and overcome challenges are a force not to be underestimated. These observations have strong implications for the ways in which the Navy's amphibious assault ships flying marine F-35Bs might be able to bolster the nuclear carrier fleet in a high-end fight. I'd like to close by offering my thanks to Rear Admiral Cox, United States Navy Retired, and Vice Admiral Daly, United States Navy Retired, for organizing and executing this contest, and General Dynamics as well. I would also like to thank the commanding officer and crew of USS Bataan, friends and colleagues, especially Commander Domachowski, United States Navy, Greg Wright, and Dr. James Fielder for their suggestions and feedback during the writing process. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank my wife, Gwen, and our sons, William, James, and Andrew, whose love and support inspire and drive me forward every day. Good morning. My name is Lieutenant George Hageman, and I'm a JAG at Naval Special Warfare Group 10 in Coronado, California. My essay was on the Battle of Tsushima, the first naval battle of the 21st century. First of all, thank you to the CNO, Admiral Gilday, for hosting the Naval History Essay Contest. And thank you as well to Admiral Cox of Naval History and Heritage Command, Admiral Daly of the U.S. Naval Institute, and General Dynamics. The Battle of Tsushima was the last naval battle of the Russo-Japanese War. Japan had invaded Korea and Manchuria and laid siege to the Russian-held city of Port Arthur. The Russians, trying to relieve Port Arthur, sent their Baltic Sea Fleet from Europe around Africa all the way over to East Asia. In the Tsushima Strait, the Japanese Admiral, Admiral Togo, waited for them. By the time the Russians arrived, their men were exhausted and sick, and their ships were beaten down. 
Admiral Togo crossed the T, just like Nelson at Trafalgar, and decimated the Russians. So what relevance does this battle have for Americans today? This battle that had no Americans involved, no American lives, no American ships. There are four lessons that I'd like to draw from this battle. Number one is a new power completely surprising an established power. At the time, no one believed that Japan, the Asian power, could defeat the established European power. And yet Japan surprised Russia, Japan surprised the world. Similarly today, the United States is the established power, China, the rising power. We cannot and we should not underestimate China. The second lesson is about concentration of forces. The Russians were globally the more powerful navy. They were split, however, between two oceans. And so in the narrow confines of the Tsushima Strait, or East Asia more generally, Japan was more powerful. They were fighting in their own backyard. Similarly, China today has a lot of strength in East Asia, in their own backyard. Whether that's the Taiwan Strait, or the Tsushima Strait, or the South China Sea, they can bring more forces to bear than the United States, a globally more powerful navy, might be able to. The third lesson to draw is technology. Japan, as the new power, had the flexibility to adopt new technologies. They were early adopters of radio technology and increased better rangefinders. That allowed them to see through the fog and spot the Russians before the Russians could spot them. Similarly, China, as the newer power, has the flexibility that, a, that an incumbent power like the United States does not have. And fourth, international legal norms. Russia, for example, sailed through the Tsushima Strait with their hospital ship's lights still on, as was customary at the time. Japan used that to their advantage, being able to spot the Russian ships before the Russians could spot them. Similarly, the United States today follows international legal norms. China, as we see in the South China Sea, often does not. As a final note, I'd like to show this. This is a Japanese military decoration given to my great-grand-uncle who fought on the Japanese side and served as a doctor in the Russo-Japanese War. If we don't under expand our study of naval history to the, the naval history and the naval battles of other countries and other cultures, we risk losing out on an entire swath of lessons available to us, lessons that we can use to our advantage in any future conflict in the era of great power competition. Thank you again to CNO Gilde, the Naval History and Heritage Command, U.S. Naval Institute, and General Dynamics. Thank you. Hello, my name is First Lieutenant James Winnefeld. I'm currently forward deployed to the American Embassy in Baghdad, Iraq, with Special Purpose MAGTAF Crisis Response Central Command. I'm very honored that my essay, The Base of Innovation, was selected as the winner of the Chief of Naval Operations Naval History Essay Contest from among a talented field. I want to thank the CNO, Admiral Gilday, for holding the contest, as well as General Dynamics, the Naval History and Heritage Command, and the U.S. Naval Institute. Without their support, many valuable lessons of history would likely never see the light of day. As our naval services enter a new era of great power competition, innovation-driven change will become essential. Just as innovation can stem from the fusion of disparate ideas, it can also benefit from knowing how it has happened in the past. That history of innovation is what I had in mind as I began to research my essay. While sifting through our storied naval heritage for examples, I discovered a small experiment in advanced-based operations held on Culebra Island during the naval winter maneuvers of 1913. There are five interwoven lessons I pulled from this example in history about leading innovation and change. The first lesson is that we must balance between being aggressive about change while also approaching it methodically. Leaders of the day made focused decisions regarding force design, structure, and posture to meet the new advanced base mission. I believe the Marine Corps is on the right track in this regard with our 2030 force design. The next important lesson was that leaders enabled innovation to occur from a position of institutional security. While it was obvious to some that advanced based operations was the future, the Marine Corps feared the removal of its detachments from ships could result in the disbandment of the Corps itself. 
Strong commitment from key leaders enabled the Marine Corps to overcome this barrier. Third, the naval services must devote time and money outside their comfort zones in order for innovation to succeed. It's easy to strangle innovation in the crib if the necessary resources are not available to see it through to validation. The right resources were committed to the 1913 Naval Winter Maneuvers for the first time to examine a Marine Corps-centric mission. The fourth lesson is that innovative ideas must be able to move rapidly up, down, and across the chain of command. Because Colonel Pope was afforded direct communication with the Commandant and other senior leaders, the key lessons he learned during the concept's evolution were quickly inculcated into doctrine and used during the final maneuvers on Culebra a few years later. The final lesson of the Culebra maneuvers was the importance of sister service cooperation during the innovation process. The amiable relationships Navy and Marine Corps leaders developed long before the maneuvers were essential for their success. Because all these lessons worked in concert during the development of advanced base operations in the early 20th century, the concept became a key contributor to War Plan Orange, the island hopping campaign of World War II. Writing about Culebra reinforced for me that evolving our capabilities and concepts to remain competitive in a dynamic environment will benefit from taking the time to understand our history. Our history which tells us that when these innovation imperatives are running on all cylinders, we win. This contest was an amazing experience for me personally. I'm grateful to the CNO, General Dynamics, the Naval History and Heritage Command, and the Naval Institute for the opportunity to participate. Thank you. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I'd like to start by thanking Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, for continuing this annual Naval History Contest. Now in its fourth year, the competition was started by Admiral John Richardson to apply the lessons of our past to the challenges of our future. And it's easy for active duty service professionals to get caught up in their busy schedules and think, History is something I can pay attention to after I retire, but it's not. The history of the Navy, the Marine Corps, and Coast Guard is vital to who we are. It forms our traditions and culture and the way we train and fight. Stories of Medal of Honor recipients provide inspiring examples of ordinary people doing the extraordinary. They remind us of what it means to serve and that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Studying history reminds us that we aren't the only leaders who have faced hard choices. In my experience, all too often when a crisis or seemingly unique set of challenges are presented, one of the next things you hear is, this has never happened before, or we're sailing into completely uncharted territory. Eventually, the readers, the thinkers who know their history provide context that informs decisions on the way forward. Next time you feel like it's never happened before, consider using the search capability available in the Naval Institute Proceedings Archive. There is a really good chance your new problem is in there. And this inextricable link between the past and the way forward is very powerful. The Naval Institute's been conducting essay contests for more than 120 years. Future leaders have entered and won these contests, including Alfred Thayer Mahan, Ernest J. King, James Sandy Winnefeld, and Jim Stavridis, all well before they became senior officers. We're always pleased to see young active duty authors leading the way in our essay contests. This year, all four winners are active duty of the rank 05 and below. Congratulations to Commander Joel Holwit, U.S. Navy, First Lieutenant James Winnefeld, U.S. Marine Corps, Lieutenant George Hageman, U.S. Navy, Lieutenant Commander Andrew Rucker, U.S. Navy. They dared to think, they dared to write, they dared to submit their essays, and we recognize their achievement today as top prize winners among the more than 100 entries we received this year. I especially want to thank General Dynamics for its generous support of this contest 
over the past four years, and in particular, acknowledge the support of Phoebe Novakovic, CEO, and Rob Smith, Executive Vice President for Marine Systems. General Dynamics is a company that has stood shoulder to shoulder with the sea services for decades, providing platforms and technology that have helped us dominate in the naval and maritime arena. Congratulations again to our award winners, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Rob Smith, Executive Vice President for Marine Systems at General Dynamics, to share a few words. Vice Admiral Daly, thank you for your kind introduction. And thanks to the U.S. Naval Institute for the important role you play in creating a forum for great minds to think, speak, and write about the important role the sea services play in our national defense. General Dynamics is proud to be a U.S. Naval Institute sponsor, and in particular, we are proud to have sponsored its Chief of Naval Operations Essay Contest since inception in 2017. Our company traces its roots back to 1899, when we were contracted by the Navy to build our nation's first submarine, the USS Holland. Today, our shipyards, electric boat, Bath Ironworks, and NASCO produce state-of-the-art ships and submarines for our Navy, including Virginia and Columbia-class submarines, Zumwalt and Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, John Lewis-class replenishment ships, and the Lewis B. Fuller-class expeditionary sea base. Having a Navy equipped with the most capable and lethal ships and submarines requires brilliant engineers to design them, highly skilled shipbuilders to construct them, and of course, dedicated sailors to operate them. But long before any of that happens, a great Navy starts with imagination and vision. Great minds thinking creatively about how to learn from the past, understand the present, and harness sea power to give our nation an edge in the future. That is what the U.S. Naval Institute and this essay contest are all about. We are giving voice to those who share the noble goal of keeping our Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard the finest in the world. So Admiral Gilday, thank you for your continued support of your namesake essay contest. We at General Dynamics are proud to be a part of it. And to our winners, Commander Joel Holwood, First Lieutenant James Winnefeld, Lieutenant George Hageman, and Lieutenant Commander Andrew Rucker, I congratulate you on a job well done. But more importantly, I thank you for applying your great minds to the worthwhile cause of shaping future of our nation's sea services. From all of us at General Dynamics, Godspeed. Well, again, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking time to uh, watch this virtual ceremony and to uh, take a moment to uh, uh, honor the winners of the CNO's uh, Naval History Essay Contest. Uh, the task was to, you know, write an essay uh, that spanned across the breadth of naval history uh, with the intent of identifying lessons that can be applicable to the uh, maintaining and uh, maritime superiority in an age of great power competition. Uh, and I think that all these essays did exactly that. Uh, so congratulations to all of them. I do want to again thank the Chief of Naval Operations for his remarks and for supporting uh, this uh, contest. And also thanks to Vice Admiral Retired Daly and the team at the U.S. Naval Institute for their superb uh, help in making this, this all work. Uh, thanks also to uh, my own team uh, who did some quite a bit of work on this as well. And thanks to those uh, who served as judges uh, for this uh, evolution. Now, and a special thanks to uh, General Dynamics for providing the uh, prizes uh, for the uh, winners of, of this contest. Uh, history uh, doesn't predict the future, but it does help you understand why things are the way they are. And if you don't understand why things are the way they are, then you're just guessing when you're trying to shape the future or figure out what the future is going to be. So we're in an era of increasing competition with our adversaries. Uh, and there may come a time again where you'll need you know, courage like those on, on the Indianapolis behind me uh, in order to deal with great power threats. Uh, but history can help uh, prepare our sailors and our leaders 
for that challenge in the future. So thank you very much and uh, take care.